Hello, my fellow randoms. My name is Kev Duffy, and welcome to this, our 44th episode of What's Your Random Podcast, where I discover and celebrate independent and individual creativity from the inception of an idea to the process and the practicalities of bringing that idea to life, be it a comic book, be it a story, be it a theatrical work, music, board game, I don't care. Creativity is beautiful and it is something that is born out of the mysterious, the human mind, individual minds that have ideas and concepts that only that individual can possess or have or create because that is the nature of the process. Um, Then through sometimes collaboration, it just grows from there. But all of these things are the things that I am interested in pursuing and learning about here at What's Your Random Podcast. And today was a special treat in that endeavor. If across the pond is to England, uh, what is it going across to get to Australia? The world? Across the globe, maybe? My first guest from Australia, Morgan Quaid. Uh, Wow, he set the bar high for future Aussie guests. I had a great time, a real pleasure speaking with Morgan about his, about everything, about creativity, about his process, about his projects, about how he stays on the move and pursues what it is he loves that is his creative passions in music and in storytelling. And we even get down and dirty into how you pay the bills. So what, I mean, this is basically, this podcast will be a guide to life for many. I learned a lot and was inspired by Morgan, and I think you will be as well. So without further ado, enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Morgan Quaid, and enjoy all of the random and... Welcoming to uh, What's Your Random Podcast, Morgan Quaid, uh, who's here to talk about Shadow's Daughter, which is already successfully funded on Kickstarter, but he has many days remaining. Um, So go figure out why everybody's so excited and why it got funded so gosh darn quickly and join the club in supporting um, Morgan. And yeah, Morgan, I'm very excited to dig into this project and uh, can't be said of all guests, but as I dug a little bit, I found that there was just a a sinkhole beneath me and I continued (laughs) to sink and sink um, because you have quite a a lot of things going for you and attached to you. And um, yeah, not to mention the plethora of guitars and banjos behind you, which We'll yeah. have, I'll have to add that to the line of questioning today to dig into that a little bit. But enough of my spiel. Welcome to What's Your Own Podcast. Cheers. Thanks, Kev. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be here. In the, yeah. uh, what is it, early evening over there or afternoon over there? Yeah, 6 p.m. And uh, yeah. you are my first Aussie guest. So oh, I, love, well, I love it. <laughs> It's it's morning the following day here, so uh, I'll I'll do my usual joke. We're we're in the future. Uh, the aliens have landed, but you know they're fine. They're nice ones. It's okay. Nice. Everyone okay. survives. <laughs> so yeah. And how's Tomorrow's the weather? On, on the... Uh, the weather's great. The, well, I mean here it's great, uh, but. Uh, yeah, I hear there's uh, some not good news. Actually, I better not say that. I was going to make a joke about there being a typhoon or something, but knowing my luck, there will be, and then you know I'll be getting mail for my predictions. So it's all great. Everything's great. <laughs> peachy keen, peachy keen. It's, um, it's all sweet. Yeah, I love announcing firsts on what's your own podcast, and this is definitely a first. I've had some South American guests, at least two, maybe three. Um, yeah, but definitely first Aussie guest. So yeah, please, you know, start with your, I would say your general self-introduction and your, you know, 
in general about you, but particular emphasis on the creative side and mm -hmm. any random pizzazz you could throw in the middle? Wow, pizzazz. I didn't, um, I didn't bring any glitter with me or anything. Um, <laughs> if you, th yeah, so if you threw glitter at the camera right now, I'd be pretty shocked and, and impressed. I was, I, I was thinking <laughs> I should have something handy that I can just press a button and Oof, that'd be great. Uh, and then I would be choking on glitter for the rest of the, um, the talk. Um, yeah. So uh, Morgan Quaid, obviously I'm an Australian. Uh, I always get tripped up by saying Australian based, but well, I'm just Australian. So yeah, I mean, I'm based, but I'm Australian. Um, yeah. Australian writer. So I write uh, fantasy, um, horror, usually fast paced, short fiction, uh, not short fiction, but so novels that are, uh, you know, 80,000, 90,000 words. So not, not extremely long, but, you know, fast paced fantasy sort of world backdrops, but with uh, first person perspectives usually. Uh, and I write um, a fair few different styles of comics uh, and, you know, the odd graphic novel here and there. Um, some of which has been released and is already out there. Some of which is in the pipeline, you know, working its way towards uh, people's hands and eyes and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and as, as you uh, uh, mentioned uh, behind me, so I'm also a, a music producer and um, I write uh, music for film and TV and that sort of stuff. Um, and that's actually what pays for the, um, uh, the artwork for the comics. Cause, uh, for those that don't know, uh, creating comics, the artwork cost is, is, is quite substantial cause there's a lot of work that goes into it. Um, and I'm just going to put my hand right here yep. and then go back. Cause it does not want to focus on my face. Sometimes this happens and I don't take offense. I do take offense. Yeah. <laughs> focus all right here we go you can focus there there we go all right sorry you need to see this in in high definition otherwise you're missing out on all the greatness goodness me and um, it, it, it really did make a difference it does i don't know the why nice, it does it nice it's like it wasn't bad bored. before but it's just that much better like i have pretty good vision and i got glasses at one point and people were like you don't need those glasses why are you wearing glasses and i was like i mean do you buy a uh, SD quality TV or HD quality TV. I want to see things like the detail. Um, you you want to see the crow's feet and you know the gray and the beard and you want to see all the gruesome detail. That's what you want. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so yeah. So as I was saying, anyway. So the music is is what pays for the artwork. Artwork uh, is the biggest expense with with writing a comic. It's different to novels and those sorts of things because obviously with a novel. Um, it's just you and you're, you know, writing and doing that. Then you have to get an editor and then a proofreader and all that. So that there are costs and then you have to promote and all that sort of stuff, which is just a treat, just a wonderful part of being a creative is, uh, is promoting your own work. That's man. Talk about an enjoyable enterprise that is. Uh, but anyway, so there's that, but with, with the, the um, comic side, um, there's the visuals which are amazing, but it's a slow process. And it's, I mean, it takes the average artist, you know, a couple of days uh, full time just to do a page, um, right. which is an insane amount of time investment and skill and all the rest of it. Um, so yeah, so the music is the way that I can fund that. So when we go to Kickstarter and I've got a project, uh, I'm not so much saying to people, Hey, please give me money so I can fund this thing. I'm more saying I've already done it. I've, I've used my own money to get this thing up because I, I, I believe in it and I like it and I want people to know about it, but please support it and I can do more and, you know, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and keep the projects snowballing and the, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. use keep the funds from this one to fund the next one and the next one and make them a little bit bigger and more grandiose. Yeah, maybe glitter covers. I don't, I, can't, I don't think anyone's ever done a cover with glitter. And now I'm obsessed with the idea of somehow I did, you know, those horrible cards you get. I got one of them for a birthday a little while ago and stupidly just <laughs> opened the thing up and then, <laughs> you know, just glitter everywhere. But doing a comic with a glitter cover, that would be interesting. I don't know who would want it, but if, <laughs> I'm going to look into it. <laughs> if not glitter, the, the foil effect from like... Mm. Nine, 80s and 90s stickers and cards 
and yeah, stuff. Yeah, well, they're, you... they're quite big, the, the foil covers. They're, they're a thing and they're... Um, are yeah. they? I haven't run across one myself, but... Yeah, I, yeah. Well, particularly in Kickstarter, it's kind of like an s- extra special thing. That, you know, I, I haven't gone into foil yet, um, but um, yeah, that's something I'll, I'll be looking at. Or even just a stupid idea like wood... You, you know not not paper but an actual wooden cover or something bizarre like that with the, <laughs> the image kind of branded on or something that just something weird like that would be great hugely expensive and you would lose money on the whole project but it would be so much fun so i don't know maybe in and the future some people would really like get pumped about it too you know oh I mean, yeah. you can make Imagine it just I'm three in. backers and i'm sure that three people would be like I'm going to have the only wood copy of this. <laughs> That's right. It's so good. You can put a, you know, a hot drink on it and, and you're fine. And then read it. And then maybe you could do every page in wood and ship it on a pallet. Oh, to them. Wow. <laughs> that would be amazing. But also just logistically a nightmare. Just, yeah, a crate turns up with the uh, page one. Wow. There you go. See, ideas, man. We're throwing around ideas. This is I great. Know. This is what I'm all about at What's Your Random Podcast. <laughs> it's certainly so, random. <laughs> what was your, um, so I assume first and foremost, you're a musician uh, by trade and profession. And that's also a highly creative field, obviously. Um, so I'm curious about kind of the interplay. Uh, well, mm. let me start by saying the evo- your evolution as a musician and artist uh, musically. And then, you know, what, what itch wasn't being scratched at what time and how did you evolve into becoming a storyteller? Mm. I'm sure there's a journey there to some degree. So, yeah, please. Yeah, there, there is. And it's kind of... Um gone from one to the other so I, I always loved writing and uh, particularly fantasy and um those those sorts of things um you know sci-fi fantasy anything with a, a new different weird strange world that i can get lost in i've always been obsessed with that sort of stuff ever since i was a kid and when when i started learning how to write the first thing i was learning how to write was stories and you know um big labyrinth adventures and all that sort of stuff so that was very young that was before the music um then in my teens i really started to pick up music get involved with bands those sorts of things I uh, started learning all the different instruments and everything. And then kind of just uh, later in life, uh, so I've worked normal jobs. I still now work a, a you know, a, a mundane job, if we want to call it that, uh, to pay the bills. So even the music isn't, isn't enough on its own to, uh, to pay for everything. Um, so, but the, uh, at a certain stage uh, with the music, I started to realize, look, there are ways that you can do the musical thing and get involved and be creative, but you can actually make enough money, you know, to um, uh, out of that, but you've just got to be very clever and you've got to be, um, it's not the, the normal sort of going to, you know, playing in a pub or a bar, you know, every weekend, you can definitely do that. That's just not me. I, I, I just, I'm not wired that way. So there's other ways that, that you can you can do it. And so primarily I've worked with other producers and other, you know, singer-songwriters, indie artists, those sorts of things. So I tend to be doing the back house side of things and putting the music together and all that sort of stuff. Um, but then at the same time, I, I've been writing novels for years. So I'm at, I think I'm about my 10th novel now that I'm just closing out. Um, but if you look online, there's only really one, I think, at the moment that's live and published and with a publisher and all that sort of stuff. The rest are in the pipeline, you know, working their way through. Is that, um, is that the one I saw on Amazon? Uh, Whiplash. Yeah, it's probably the one. Uh, might, might be. There's another one with coming a, up With a red month. cover? Yes, red. red cover. That's the one. Okay. Yeah. It's a sort of young adult fantasy, um, you know, very fast paced, very, very fun. Um, kind of Ender's Game meets, uh, uh, I don't know, Maze Runner or something like that. Like it's that sort of real action packed, get involved and, you know, lots of stuff. So anyway, so I've been writing for years, but, you know, the it's the classic tale, struggling to find a literary agent, struggling to find a way to get these things out there. But all the while I've been writing in the background. And then uh, about seven years ago, I think it was, or something like that, 
never been involved in comics, never read comics when I was younger. They were confusing to me because you've got words and then images and then which one do you go to first? And then how do you, I, I didn't, it just, you know, bamboozled my brain. So I never really got into it. And I wasn't really big into the whole superhero thing and the DC Marvel thing, just wasn't interested in men of spiders and men of bats and you know <laughs> superman and it just wasn't it, it just didn't interest me it wasn't weird enough even though i now know there's tons of weird stuff in there but i just didn't at the time so anyway seven years ago i walk into a comic shop in uh, brisbane and pick up uh, i think it was a copy of chew which is an image uh, comics comic and there's like you know 13 of these things and i picked that one and started reading and thought my god this thing is amazing what was just, the impetus for jumping in the comic book shop if you weren't? Um, was it very fortuitous? Or? It was it was a happy circumstance because it was boredom at work on my way to the bus, but having to wait for a bus. And then I saw a comic shop and I thought, yeah, why not? I'll, you know, I'll, I'll go and have a look. Uh, and then I just picked one up and that was it. I was hooked because I had no idea the indie comic scene even existed. And I had no idea that, there were many, many, many great stories out there in comic form that weren't superhero stories and they weren't spandex wearing cape wielding sort of, you know, heroes. Uh, and there was deep, intense stuff going on and, you know, real sort of guttural sort of things happening and a lot of, you know, a lot of things being explored and just a lot of fun as well. So, yeah, I, I lost all my money that day uh, and walked out with a big <laughs> pile of comics and then the next year was me reading everything I could get. <laughs> Did you really um, just like empty your wallet that day? Oh yeah, whatever, whatever I had, it was okay. Well, this is this is my thing now. This is what I what I need to I, do. So I just I love, ordered it all out. I love um, it. I just I recently got into LPs and records, and I went to the record store the other day, and I very similarly like had a stack about this. Why? I mean, it's all used. Like not spending yeah. all that much money, but I was I felt even guilty going to the register. Like, is this normal? So I, it, it's that resonates it's with thing. me, your story. <laughs> it's a, it's a, this, a, this, this capacity that we have. And I, I it, it's certain people and it's a capacity we have to instantly be obsessed by a new thing. Like <laughs> it, it, as soon as we're on it, it's like, well, this is everything for me now, at least for the next few years. And I'm going to read everything. And so that's a lot of the, the comic books that you can see uh, behind me. We're, we're just grabbing everything and graphic novels and everything. Um, and then my next step, like um, before I'd even finished reading my first comic that I'd, that I'd read was, okay, well, I have, you know, six novels. Uh, I need to turn these into comics and I need to do that now. And not even to the point of, I need to find some people and talk to them and find out how this whole thing works. No, no, no. Just skip all of that and just go straight to, I need an artist and I need to write the script and do the thing and, then begins a seven year process of making every mistake you could possibly make and learning. And then finally realizing, Oh, I should really talk to the people that have done this before. And then learning as I'm going and thinking, Oh, okay, that makes more sense now, you know? And so, and that's kind of where I am where it's music is the sort of foundational thing that I do all the time. And I still absolutely love it. Um, then there's uh, the comics, which is, you know, really starting to get some traction. There's a, I've got a decent kind of body of work now and a lot more coming out. And then there's novels, which I'm now starting to pick up and move with. And so it's kind of like spread with there, the area. So the three areas where traditionally you just don't make money, that's where I'm <laughs> investing. That's where I'm putting all my time and energy into things that you're just not going to make money out of, which is great, you know. Similar to you picking up the comics, I think uh, creativity is you have to strike when the iron is hot and when your motivation, energy, excitement is there. Because, you yeah. know, at least speaking for myself, I have sat on ideas and let that wave pass me without riding it. And then I, you know, mm -hmm. a creative urge, let's say that that is representative uh, or represented by that wave. And then I feel kind of guilty and um, disappointed in myself that I didn't get up on the surfboard to ride it and go on that journey to try to, whatever came of it, who cares, but actually try to ride the, ride the wave of that creativity and that idea and that inspiration. So um, all jokes man. aside, kudos to you for 
for doing all three of them simultaneously and being excited about them because that sort of excitement is cre uh, is contagious in the creative space on Kickstarter. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm Thanks, obviously man. enjoying talking to you and getting motivated by it right now. So sweet. Yeah, I, I, I heard a there's this thing in, in writing where you need to write every day and you need to discipline yourself and you need to have a word count and you need to, which is all great. But I discovered a few years ago, I, I work best exactly like you say. And, and I, you know, I'm not saying I'm Da Vinci. <laughs> you know, that's, that's for other people to say, I'm not going to know. But the, the thing I loved about Da Vinci, you know, when you learn a little bit about him is just, he had 50,000 unfinished projects because he would just go on a whim with wherever the excitement was leading him. And I tend to do the same thing. I mean, there are certain things you just have to do and be disciplined to do. But also if I'm excited about a thing, I'll write 300,000 words in a day. You know, I'll just be so excited. You'll get so much out of me. Whereas if I'm not, it's just hard graft and it's terrible. And, and sometimes you have to do that, but I've, I've, I don't know. I, I yeah, I kind of like to go where the inspiration is going. Like I say, ride that wave until it burns out a little bit. And then you can look back and go, okay, what have I got? And, and what can I do with that? And the amount you can get done is, is extraordinary. Um, so yeah, hundred percent agree. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And going, uh, I could relate to this to a, um, common friend of ours or common acquaintance in Ryan Claydor, who just successfully funded uh, his Kickstarter for yeah. Hunter's Tale. And I saw that you yeah. had a, a brief interview with him and um, on my podcast on What's Your Random, as well as on a couple of at least one other podcast, he talked about this concept of being a phoenix or an octopus and basically working so hard that you burn out as a phoenix does and then eventually rising mm. from your own ashes to subsequently probably burn out again on a different project <laughs> but yeah you know really investing yourself in one area so wholeheartedly and so energetically mm. and so devotely that you burn out and that's okay i mean you're going to have mm. a finished product in the end but you might need time to recover and then another if i'm getting this right another approach perspective is the octopus strategy where you have multiple projects going on once and you're, you have, a, you know, maybe you're a mutant octopus and you have 11 arms as opposed to eight. I don't know. Um, so my, the question I pose to him is, is it possible to be octopus Phoenix? Octo Phoenix. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Where, where just individual arms burn out and then, you know, have to grow back and all that. Yeah. You I, know? you know, octopus do regenerate. They do. They do. Right. So the Quebec We're on to something oh, here. <laughs> there's a story ready to be written there. Um, yeah, well, I, I'm the, uh, yeah, I'm definitely on the octopus side, um, but I do, I'm on both. Yeah, I'm exactly as you say, because I'll, I'll just dive headfirst into something and just burn it out and then take a step back and reevaluate and then try. But I'm also just terrible in terms of boredom i get bored so quickly with things even when i'm writing i have to write things that are engaging and everything to keep myself awake so <laughs> I, I tend to write in that that style um same with anything i'm put together it's got to interest me but that also means I'll, I'll always have five different projects i'm working on at the same time because it keeps me interested and engaged and if one just I'm pushing at, at a door and I just can't get through, I just shift to another one and then, oh, that's good for a while and then shift to another. It, so it's all kind of moving forward. But yeah, it, I do really identify with that, you know, multiple arms. There's also, I mean, coming from the in, uh, music side of things, if you, you can, he's exactly right. You can do it either way. You can do one thing and you can just push as hard as you can for as long as you can and then see success that way or you can spread out. I found because I'm not a singer, um, because I, contrary to public opinion, do not have the face uh, of an angel, uh, you know, so because I'm not going to be the front man and I'm going to have my own band and I'm going to be doing that side of music, um, I needed to branch out and I need to have seven or eight different areas where I'm getting a little bit of income and seeing a little bit of movement. Um, rather than trying to put all my eggs in one basket, because that's just not going to work for what I do. 
Um, and to make money in, in the music industry these days, if you're an indie, that's usually the smart move. You think of it as a, as a small business and you sell five or six different products or services rather than all I do is write my own music and that's it. And I just promote that. Whereas other people will just want to do, I'm a singer songwriter and this is what I want to do. And this is my everything and I'll throw everything into it. And, and but that's just not, not me. Um, and the comics and, and writing was the same thing. And I think it's also born out of this, uh, wanting to try different things and when one thing doesn't mm. work try another and then when one thing because it's so hard to get to cut through in today's world there's so much opportunity but also there's so much so much competition and also people have only so much money to invest and so much you know time and all and the rest time of it. and attention yeah yeah exactly yeah. so you're, you're asking kickstart is a classic case it's a, a friend of mine described it as being a convention a comic book convention it's the same sort of thing you're essentially sitting there lining up next to all these other people all offering amazing stuff and people are wandering by and you say hey bro come and look at this it's a thing you need this thing and as a creative most of us really struggle with promotion self-promotion because the it's distasteful. It's gross talking about money. If, if, if I was independently wealthy, I would be giving this stuff away and trying to, you know, just get it out there. And just and doing it because you want to create. Just doing yeah. it. Yeah. And that's really common with, with creators. But, but it, it, unfortunately, it, it damages us because um, you need to promote shamelessly just to be able to be heard. Even the... Um, the Facebook, or are we calling it Meta now? I don't even know. I mean, just kid, changing anyway. Whatever. <laughs> um, the algorithms that, that work behind, you know, all social media and that sort of thing. Um, it's so interesting. So I, I was asking fellow comic creators, and I was saying, look, when I'm running a campaign, I feel like I'm just pestering everyone, and their ears are bleeding because I'm just continually pushing out. And they all came back with exactly the same feedback, which was, um, you're not. Because nine <laughs> times out of 10, only 5% of your audience is seeing what you're putting out because the algorithm won't show it to the rest. Right. So it, even though it feels like you're shouting this thing, you'll still get people come up after a 30 or 40 day campaign and say, you had a campaign running? And you think, dude, I sent emails. I sent like a gazillion posts. I was like running around on the rooftop. You didn't hear at all. <laughs> no, man, I, I didn't hear. So that's, it's an interesting one, but it's so... Um, antithetical to who we are as creatives a lot of us anyway it's a really hard thing to get past to just go and even appearing on podcasts getting your face out there all really important i don't know i mean most of us are pretty insular and shy and we want to make our thing and then we just want to put it out there and run away so, yeah, <laughs> big learning curve yeah there it is there it is world discover it but no one's going to discover it if you don't yeah anyway it's a one of those hard lessons. Yeah. You know. I mean, I, uh, by profession and day job, I do sales and, uh, I'm not bad at selling and talking and finding, you know, the, um, the points of differentiation and all of these salesy businessy kind of things. But I did go into a, I have a small comic project I'm working on and I did some at home prints and I went into a comic shop and was like, Hey, will you take these for free? <laughs> like I like it's a totally different person who's doing his day yeah. job versus actually selling what I'm actually passionate about and love. Want to put my heart, soul, blood, mind, money into. And for some reason, yeah. that thing that is most cherished, I cannot yeah. for the life of me talk about in a coherent manner. <laughs> So, so I have, a, I have some advice on this because I've struggled with exactly that same thing and exactly the same. You walk in and you're like, you're humbly like Oliver sort of, you know, offering this like, thing. And hey, I like your shop. Um, yeah. will you, uh, I'm giving this to you for free. Maybe your give voice it to is, some cool is people. cracking like a teenager. <laughs> yeah. Can I, uh, can I uh, give you this? For, please take it. I'll pay you to take it. it is, yeah. Um, I don't know what to do right now with my hands. <laughs> yeah. That's, I'll just, I'll let myself out. Um, yeah. So my advice is, and I mean, take it or leave it. It's, it's a silly thing, but the way that I approached it is 
I have to present myself as a, a character, as a different. So Morgan, the promoter, is not the dude that wrote these things and that it's his baby. I'm the dude out here to sell stuff. And my job is to sell and promote. And it, it's this horrible thing that me as a person, I don't, I don't buy this stuff, but me as promoter absolutely buys this thing. People need this in their life. You know, I'm doing the world a service by, by selling this to people. People need it. It's awesome value. It's an amazing story. Their life is not going to be complete with it. You almost have to sell that lie to yourself that I'm not that guy. He's still, he's still in a cupboard somewhere writing. I'm, a, um, I'm now a sneak, sneak oil uh, that's confidence right. man. I'm the salesman. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's it, true you though. It's true. Separate that's yourself advice. from the art. Yeah. Yeah. That's Absolutely. good advice. I'm also imagining that you put on a tie regardless of if you have a collared shirt on or not <laughs> just shorts t-shirt tie <laughs> yep absolutely yeah you, you gotta you gotta do it it's glasses really glasses that you don't even need and you take them off and, yeah. <laughs> those glasses i sometimes wear um no it's really valuable advice like as as much as we're joking about it to be able to separate yourself a little bit and you know, you kind of, you mentioned it um, at the start of the chat, and it's also a discussion I had with another mutual acquaintance of ours, Onishi Press. Um, oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, they were on the show uh, not too, too long ago. And in that episode, we talked pretty deeply about, like, promoting creative work as a creator. And mm. it, you know, a lot of us have an aversion to it. It's, we look at it as scary salesy a time suck you know mm. everything that we don't want to be as creators um yeah but at the same time looking at it from a different angle with the day and age and digital uh connectivity as it is it is also a tremendous opportunity to do it yourself mm -hmm. and not rely on the traditional gatekeepers so it's like the rubber needs to hit the road somewhere to get it into people's hands and maybe, and, you know, I, I do believe that this is the better option, even if we still maintain some of our uh, negative feelings towards the actual activities, but you got to do them to, to get them into people's hands. It's yeah, you're exactly right. And, and it's, um, I, I, I hear actors have exactly the same issue that they, they want to do their craft and yes, it's in front of a camera, but that's the thing that they like to do. They don't want to be going to, you know, Jimmy Kimmel or, you know, the late show or wherever and sitting there for five minutes in a very fake environment, you know, saying a few anecdotes and then saying, Oh, here's, here's the movie that I'm, you know, bound to um, promote because of my contract. It's the same sort of thing. In fact, I heard, I, I don't know if it's right, but I heard a rumor about, um, uh, oh, come on. He's an Aussie actor, gladiator, um, um, Russell Crowe. Yes. Russell Crowe. So Russell Crowe, who, you know, legendarily hates, uh, hates uh, interviews and all that sort of stuff because of the fake nature and everything. And I, and I think he got advice from, I think he said, he tells this story. He got advice from, God, I'm terrible at names. Uh, Hannibal in the original Science of the Lambs. Welsh actor, amazing. He's been in everything. I know exactly who you're talking about, but I'm just keeping a straight face because I can't remember either. Anthony... Hopkins. Uh, Hopkins. 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 Yes. Oh, this is so bad. I'm glad this isn't a movie review show or anything. Anyway, so his advice to to um, uh, Russell was, when you're sitting down at, to promote, it's acting. Just treat the whole thing as though you were acting. It's part of your acting role. It's not you as an individual and a creator doing that. Which I thought that's genius advice. It's the same sort of thing with us. The problem is if you're not an actor, it's quite it's quite hard to just switch <laughs> that and go, oh yeah, it's acting. But that that's yeah, it's a really it's such a big thing, and it's it, I, I kid you not. Every single post I put out, every single email I just sent out two emails today, and every single one I'm waiting for a comment that says you horrible individual why are you wasting my time with this spam you filthy filthy salesmonger i'm waiting for that i'm waiting for people to opt out of the email list i'm waiting for someone to post this morgan quaid guy is just a fake it is whatever all of that 
that stuff under the surface and you just have to squash it down because the reality is that doesn't happen or it very rarely happens. And if people unenroll from your mailing list, that's good because they were not really going to support you. If they're not really interested, they're not a real fan, um, which means they're just bulking up a list. You want that list to be accurate, not just have right, lots right. of people in it. So it's, it's all a good thing. The problem is we're hardwired to remember the bad and forget the good. So the day after I've had a great success, like I've just got signed something to a publisher or, you know, some new milestone has happened. And I think, wow, that's amazing. I, I kid you not, the last comic that I got signed to a, a publisher, uh, which I can't even talk about yet because it comes out later in the year. But anyway, really exciting stuff. I was so excited that day. So excited. It lasted until exactly about 7 a.m. the next morning. And then immediately it's like, oh, nothing's happening. It's so slow. This industry is <laughs> so sapping it everything from me. It wasn't a uh, event or uh, occurrence in the opposite direction. It was just the fact that there wasn't uh, additional propulsion fo forward. Exactly. <laughs> it's it's the it's the social media thing. It's and I don't think social media has caused this. I think it it is hijacking a kind of inbuilt human impulse to. Um, trigger dopamine or whatever it is when a positive thing happens to us where we see our sort of dream edge a little bit closer to where we're heading mm. um so as soon as it's done it's forgotten because you're thinking ah uh, good 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 so what about the next the net where why haven't where's I got the next today? dopamine What's, hit where's the next that's right news? they yeah. don't they don't love me anymore they <laughs> And it's, I it's had so one when, and I want more <laughs> that's right it's an addiction it's so an addiction <laughs> And there's this weird thing. This is why I like talking to people. And, and whenever a, a fan or just someone that reads my stuff talks to me, I'll always respond back because it's you, you do feel like as a creator, often you're throwing your work into a void mm. and you don't know, do they love it? Do they hate it? And, and because of our negative sort of brain, even though I can see there's someone that's backed my last three campaigns, three in a row, um, they're obviously a fan. You're not going to do that if you're not, you know, a fan, <laughs> but I'll still be thinking, I wonder if they actually like it or if there's some other weird reason that they're doing this or, you know, it, it, it's, it's like your brain won't accept the fact that people actually like your stuff and are looking forward to the next installment and are actually, you know, involved in the story and love the characters as much as you do or more, you know, all that sort of stuff. It's such a strange thing because you don't have this immediate, and, and I suppose in the COVID age as well, not having conventions so much anymore, uh, certainly in our part of the world, um, you don't have that immediate connection with people. So you can't see, oh, that there are there are people that like my stuff. So I have I have three or four people that are their friends and you know, but they also love this sort of stuff. And I know whatever I do they will love it and they will support it. So whenever you kind of think, oh, nothing's going on, you just go back to them and think, but at least at least I have three people that love it. That's that's something, you know, that's an audience. Anyway, the psychology of a creator, hey? Eh? Yeah. Is there anything to do? Like, I mean, I deal with it on a daily, if not hourly, if not minutely, if minutely is a word, um, basis, the self-doubt of like, why am I doing this or am I doing it the right way or how is it going to be judged essentially? And then yeah. because you're worried about external judgment, then you start just hyper judging it yourself with uh, very little need or basis to do so. Um, yeah. So is there anything that you do in your creator's tool box toolkit, as I call it, like uh, activity or anything um, to get around that when you feel those feelings, emotions, thoughts creeping in and you just want to put them at bay and be like, you know, return to maybe not the level of a dopamine hit, but somebody mm -hmm. who's coming down or, or <laughs> coming down from a, a good one. Yeah. I th there's probably two main things that, that I do <laughs> very regularly. Um, and the first one is, as soon as a project is done and out there and I'm promoting. So now, for instance, with the Shadows Daughter campaign, um, I'm editing the next three volumes of this same series. Um, 
doing the second pass edit on uh, my next novel um, and uh, started a new comic yesterday, a short comic to go out in another campaign that someone else is doing and I'm kind of an anthology sort of thing. So the, the first thing for me is as soon as the thing is done, I'm on to the next thing straight away. So I, I can't worry about how well that's received because, well, I'm invested in this now. This is the most important thing for now. I've got to get this right. It's kind of a trick because you still have to promote that. Otherwise, it won't go anywhere. So you're still right. doing all, putting all your work into that. And you, you do care that it succeeds. But it's a little thing to sort of say, I can't worry about if it doesn't go as good as I would like, because this is the thing that I'm focusing on now. So it's kind of a shift, shift focus. The other thing is, and I don't know, this, this is a psychological trick I've used uh, probably too often. Um, Are you a Jedi? Let me ask that first. I don't know. See, I don't, I don't agree with the whole Jedi Sith dichotomy. There's, there's a middle ground, man, Mandalorian style. There's a middle ground and I've got to be in that middle ground. Cause I, but, but do Mandalorians have mind tricks? Well, see, this is the thing. <laughs> yes, surely there's some sort of nascent ability that they can bring. I just, I, that's my big problem with the Star Wars universe is it's too split with black and white. And it doesn't make sense. There's, there's, there's more levels than that. It's like re Republican and Democrat, for want of a better thing. There's more than that. You can't just divide right. things into two. It's, 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 the world is more complex and Jedis are more complex. So I would say yes, but no, but kind of. And maybe. Um, but maybe, <laughs> but not, but also. Uh, but yeah, so the, the other trick that I do all the time, and, and I'm, it's very, very easy for me to do because I live in a, a wealthy country. Um, we have a lot of space. I mean, a lot of it you can't really use, but we do have a lot of space. <laughs> um, uh, I've always had a job. I've always had a roof over my head. I've always had clothes. I've always had, even, you know, my family went through periods where we didn't have a lot, but we always had enough. And me with my, my family and my son and, and wife, we have more than enough. It is a privilege, the fact that I can waste my time doing this thing that I love and not work, you know, 14 hours a day, seven days a week, or, you know, even worse, not have enough money to eat and all that sort of stuff. So I, I suppose if we, we're always comparing to what's above instead of what's behind or below, I find it's much, much more beneficial to compare to those that have less and that struggle more and that don't have the opportunity that I have, because then immediately I feel like, what am I whinging about? Oh my God. So I didn't win a book, a prize or something, but, but who, who cares? You, you know, right. I get yeah. to live a life that I love. I get to do this amazing, creating creative thing. I'm already so far above. If you'd spoken to me when I was, you know, seven year old Morgan, um, where, where I thought I would be or what I would be doing, you know, so yeah, that really helps put things in perspective because I think we just get so fixed on so-and-so's doing an amazing job and that this really damaging narrative of like the, the Harry Potter kind of narrative that, you know, oh, instant success. Well, I mean, you know, she was writing for years and years and years and getting rejection mm. letters and all this sort of stuff. You didn't see any of that. You just saw the end result. And then also the many, many, many millions of dollars put into promotion for the book and all that, you know, so it's, uh, so it, that's really damaging because it makes indie creators think, well, it should be an overnight success. And if it's not, I'm doing something terribly wrong, but no, most of this stuff, they're working in secret for years and years and years, getting better at their craft. And, and yeah, anyway, so it's a perspective thing. I think that helps. Um, a lot. That is helpful, even for me to just hear you say it, because it's something I try to remember to do to, uh, you know, the, there's a zoom out trick that's some, somewhat similar in terms of establishing perspective of your place in the universe. It's like, you're, yeah. you're on the top of your head, you're looking at your, your bald spot, and then you zoom out a little bit, you're looking at the surrounding room, you zoom out a little bit, you're in the building or house or structure you're in zoom out a little uh, bit more and just keep going until you don't know what's further out there and, and yeah. imagine all of the, all of the beautiful people or however that Beatles song goes um, that are, that are surrounding you and having different struggles and a lot of people, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't have the, the fortune that you have to be doing what you're doing, where you're doing it, how you're doing it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And 
it's a, that's a trick I haven't used in quite a while that you just reminded me of. So yeah, thank you. Value, valuable uh, lesson there. Cool, I dub the Jedi. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Even though you reluctantly accept. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to, happy to be a Jedi. Absolutely. <laughs> I just don't like clubs, man. I don't want to be in a club. I don't want labels. <laughs> I like that too. I like that too. Um, so building off of the Harry Potter reference, I mean, I see that your first Kickstarter for Idle Thuggery was in 2017. And then you had kind of a hiatus on Kickstarter, at least. Mm. And I'm assuming that it wasn't a hiatus in general, but on Kickstarter until February of 2021, when you had um, Shadow's Daughter um, I guess the first iteration or first, first issue. Um, mm. and then quickly after that, you followed up in May, 2021 with enmity enmity. Enmity. Yeah. Enmity. Tricky to say. Uh, it's tricky to yeah. say. And I, I also tend to have marbles in my mouth um, as anybody <laughs> who listens to the podcast knows, um, there, I, I like to think the marbles are a signature of my, <laughs> um, but yeah. So I, I mean, I get the sense that you have, I don't even want to call it a backlog, but you have a lot going on at once. You have many things in development in various stages, in various medias and mediums. And mm. um, maybe we could, I, I could summate the question by asking it specifically about Shadow's daughter and the trajectory that it took from the inception of that idea, which is, mm. you know, that's a lot about what this podcast is discovers and, and explores and it's in the the uh initial tag that i say at the beginning of every episode um mm -hmm. looking at the initial idea that sparked the the story how you put it to paper and how it's evolved from an idea to basically what you're putting out now is an anthology or a, a book right i mean how many issues is it now and and please let me know all of the details from the beginning to the end of shadow's cool. daughter <laughs> cool that's a lot uh cool all right well i'll start at the end and go back to the beginning um so the the current campaign has six issues they're all uh over 40 pages so they're traditional comics are 22 pages so they're, they're kind of double size mainly because I, I hate backing a campaign that i really like and then you get the comic and you're like over in five minutes and it's done and you think well but wait, now I've got to wait another year to get the rest of it. And I will have forgotten by then. And so I wanted this to be a nice chunky uh, project. So that hence six books. So it's about 240 odd pages. Um, and there's some bonuses coming up, which means that'll even get bigger. Um, so that, so that's where it currently stands. There's also a novel, which takes me back to the beginning. So the beginning, it started as a novel which uh, I was going to publish and then I just sat on it for a while and then I got involved in the comics and then I just threw it at the comics because- How many years thought, ago was that, if I could interject? Oh, six or seven, maybe? Hang on, 17. <laughs> yeah, probably about six, six, seven years ago. I had to count the years on my fingers, people. Uh, anyway, um, so it started, and, and look, the, the original impetus for the idea, you know how sometimes, uh, so Star, uh, Star Trek, classic example, um, the um, um, transporter, the most iconic recognizable fact of, of Star Trek. And the, uh, I'm presuming this is true because I heard it on the internet, so it's got to be true. Um, the reason why they went that way is because it was too expensive to build shuttles. So there's a perfectly mundane, practical reason why this amazing thing happened that just revolutionized the way we think about science fiction and all that sort of stuff. It's the same thing with Shadow's Daughter. There's a stupid reason why I even started. And that reason was, I'm never going to write about vampires. I'm never going to write about werewolves. I'm done. They're, this was right at the height of, you know, um, Twilight and all that sort of stuff. And I'm like, there's just nothing new to write that I'm it, it, it interested. I don't want them to be shiny. Even if they're not shiny, I don't want a love story. I don't want to say just was completely against the idea of ever writing anything. And then as, as I'm going along the writing journey, I thought you gotta, you gotta challenge yourself, man. You gotta do something that you don't want to do. And what's the thing at the moment that you absolutely don't want to do? Vampires and werewolves, paranormal, urban fantasy stuff. So that's what got me started. And then I started writing. And of course, everything has a slightly different 
twist. So vampires tend to be more feral in, in this story. Um, werewolves are called Vorgan because it's slightly different. So there's a little bit of a twist, which is how I kid myself that they're not really vampires. They're just slightly, <laughs> but they are totally vampires. And um, uh, so I just started uh, writing. And of course, anything of mine tends to have a big world around it because I'm just addicted to complex worlds. So that's that's what happened. So the, the underlying so story we, is also, oh, can I jump in and interrupt just, a, yeah. I want to know more about that prompt, like the prompt challenge yourself by doing exactly what you don't want to do in writing a story in this genre or subgenre. Um, like what yeah. was the, were you sitting down and you're like, I need a project or, or what was the situation and circumstance in which you gave yourself, you know, what I'm calling a prompt? It was on the back. I had a mate of mine, uh, Mike, that, that was living with us for a while. And he was a graphic designer right into Photoshop and all that sort of stuff. So he was getting right into that. And then I was, I mean, he was upstairs. I was downstairs. So I just, every night would be sitting there with him and what, what, show me what you can do. Show me the thing. And, and then I learned how to do that sort of stuff from him and everything. And he was the one that said, oh, dude, you should, I'll, I'll do some design stuff for you if you want to do a book, but like do maybe short stories or something. Never done a short story before. And I thought, uh, I thought maybe a short story is the answer because previously I'd started writing epic fantasy and those things are huge. So 160, 180,000 words. I still have my first fantasy novel at that's that, that size that I haven't re-edited because it's a monster. And every time I go back to it, it just makes sadness in my heart space because of the amount of <laughs> editing I have to do. So so uh, he, he just suggested that. And I thought, you know what, that that's a really cool idea because tr training myself to write short, concise pieces, because I tend to be a bit verbose when I'm writing, that might really help me hone my craft and blah, blah. Mm. So I started doing that. He did the book with me and we, we sort of put it together. And then I started thinking, I like this idea of restricting myself somehow or making a change and then forcing me to write because it the restriction prompts different ideas and like the star trek thing the, the, right. the financial restriction prompts you to think of a different idea which you know and it's the same with writing um and so one of those was things i never said i would do by the way zombies are the next one um and that's that's coming but not not just yet but that's another one i've said i'm never going to do a zombie zombie thing i'm totally going to do a zombie thing um <laughs> but um the yeah so that was the impetus so, uh, so it was after that time and after that book had come out and i don't remember where i was or what i was doing but i just remember thinking oh that's right i remember now oh god this is going to be all right i should almost give flip me my all around. of the juicy details all right so this is i'm not proud of this i'm not proud this of is this. A, all this is a what's your random exclusive <laughs> this is so researching writing and i was trying struggling to be a novelist and all that sort of stuff and trying to break into that area it's so depressing and hard to get into and all the rest of it and i read the figures that something like 85 percent of the books that are sold worldwide are romance novels and so i thought all right i'm going to challenge myself i'm going to write a romance novel and that's going to be my thing dumbest thing i've so if i could if i could impart anything to anyone and i know a million people have said this but don't don't go writing or creating to chase what's what's currently fashionable. Write mm. what you love, write what you want to do until that becomes fashionable. Don't do it the other way around because it's just a path to misery. Anyway, so I started researching, writing, and the, the even in the research, it was destroying me bit by bit by bit because romance novels, nothing happens. It's, they're incredibly <laughs> slow. There's a lot of words. It's all emotion and feeling and all that. And it's, you can't have, you know, oh, space alien invasion and now time travel. And then this thing, and it, too much, too much. Whereas my stuff is just a million things happening and the, the protagonist is getting wrenched one way or the other. So I wrote it. I had a friend that was in a romance sort of reading circle, sent the book to her, did all this sort of stuff. She came back and she said, oh, it's a really vivid world that you've created. Really interesting. And I said, oh, okay. Yeah, it's not romance. <laughs> oh. Oh, okay, so I've just written what I normally write and just put some sexy bits in it. It's not really right. No, no, that's not romance. I could not do it. Couldn't. I couldn't even crack it in my head. And even if I could, let's say I write one romance novel and it does well, 
now I'm shackled to this genre that I don't, it's not really my thing. And I have to write more of these things, which is going to be like fumbling in the dark because it's not, I don't naturally go to all this sort of stuff. Anyway, so that didn't work. But as a result of that, at the end of that process, I remember thinking, all right, let's take a half step then. Um, vampires and werewolves, hugely popular, very big. I said I'd never do it. Let's go that way because I know I could do that and probably do okay with it. So that's where it came from, my shameful uh, journey through romance writing, which lasted all of a year and was not enjoyable for anyone, least of all anyone that had to read it. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's what got me there uh, to the novel. And the novel itself was the first novel I wrote, I think, which was first person present perspective, but with an expansive uh, fantasy sci-fi sort of world, which has now become my preferred writing style for novels. And can uh, you almost give me all a, of them give, are like that. Can you give me a sentence from the first person present? Oh, I can. Let me... Uh, let me bring read, something up for you. Read to me, Morgan. All right. All right. I'll put on <laughs> read, my... Read to me your words. Voice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here we go. So we're going... We'll go from Whiplash because that's that's there. Um, all right. You ready? <clears throat> uh, now, do you want it in... Um, do you want it in American accent? Are, are your ears able to uh, handle a... a crappy Aussie accent or would you prefer me to put it more in the now I just want to hear you do any accent that's not your your own oh I can well see most of them are offensive the American I can probably get away with if I try other cultures it tends to get offensive pretty quick and fairly cliche <laughs> give me the American um, I'll be the only the American we'll be All right. we're we're not easily offended or are we okay cool no not at all not we'll at all. find out <laughs> <laughs> Now, I, I've got no idea where this accent is, and I'll probably end up uh, mirroring your accent if I can, because that I'm hearing it. Uh, anyway, uh, it'll take a few words to get into it. Okay. Because I have to talk slowly in American to, to get... I rush too much in Australian, so I have to... Okay. Uh, okay. American. 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 <clears throat> it starts with a knock on my front door at 3 a.m. I figure it's Amy. She's lost her keys again. And instead of breaking in through the bathroom window like any normal person, she starts hammering on the door, waiting for old Jackie boy to save the day. Knock, knock, knock. I jam my head into the pillow and try to ignore the thudding. The knocking gets louder and my teeth start to grind. I slide out of bed and head down the stairs in my PJs. It's only once walking towards the car. <laughs> I've lost the accent. Walking towards the corridor that I realize how badly I need a piss. Sorry for the word. First, I need to get to that door and stop that damn knocking. Knock, knock, knock. I open the door, expecting to see my sister half-tanked and grinning like a loon. Instead, there's a ginger dwarf in the middle of the doorway, looking up at me with an evil grin. The guy standing behind him is a mountain in a black suit who looks like he's been carved out of solid rock. Have I missed something? Halloween's not for months yet. Ginger gives me an, a little nod. Okay, now I have to switch. Well, you're not much to look at. I'd beg you for machine gun fodder, but I suppose Giant has his reasons. And then on from there. So it's a, it's an, very, it starts yeah. with an abduction. He gets abducted. Insert, uh, insert applause here. That was very well done. <laughs> I, was, I was riveted. Um, and I'm amazed at your ability. And then I extrapolate this to all the actors who I love and, and am impressed by and then find out they're Australian and like, how are they speaking with such a fluid and a better American accent than I have. <laughs> You're too kind. You're too kind. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I can hear when I'm saying it, when I've, there's certain words that are just, I can't quite get and you can hear the Australian twang and, but. No, um, that was great. That was great. Was, Very film noir. Cool. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's what I was, that's what I was going for. And the content, um, I felt like I uh, was teleported into a Murakami novel. Very oh surreal wow, that's cool and, yeah you know it, it, these... it is that sense yeah. yeah and that 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 novel in particular the whole impetus behind that is i want the protagonist to have no idea what's going on and their world is just turned upside down and i want the reader to experience that same kind of what the hell man what, what what's where am i what, what's going on what there's no and there's no reason given until later on and yeah it's that that kind of journey which is fun well, if you do an audio 
book version, I think you should read it in an American accent as challenging as that might be to do a full read through of, uh, yeah. I'm well still done. thinking of it. I've done the first chapter. I've got the first chapter up on my website, but I, yeah, it, it, you're right. It's a lot of work. My big problem, the female voices. I'm going to have to get someone to do that because I, I'll come off sounding like a witch, you know, so, <laughs> yeah, tackling kind of, I can't do a, a legitimately, you know, decent female voice. Uh, so, but yeah, I'm thinking about it for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So I, I derailed you, but I'm glad, I'm glad I did. I, I usually am glad I do, but um, you know, I also don't like interrupting my, my guests. Um so to bring us back on that track, I think we were talking about the the evolution of Shadow's daughter mm. um, and the many the early iterations, the trans transition, I guess, to comics. Yeah, and the 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 thing that I found with the novel is I just genuinely enjoyed writing the character, particularly the main character, but the other characters as well, and the story just kind of came together and. Uh, I, I just loved it. I fell in love with the, the characters and that and it's that thing where once they're written and you kind of gel with the story, they now exist. Even if no one else in the world has seen them, they exist, which means if I'm writing anything about Summer Rain, I know what she would say and I know how she would think. And I know because she's, she's her thing now. She's not, you know, she already exists. So that was really surprising and really great. Then when I started moving to comics, I thought, this would work great as a comic, but I was also, I hadn't done anything with a manga style. All my uh, comics that had been a standard kind of American artwork style. So I thought I'll do a kind of westernized manga style because this story kind of has lots of action, um, which suits that, that um, medium really well. Um, found an artist online, started working with them on the, on the first issue. Um, I actually put it up. At, it's still up now uh, on uh, Webtoons and Tapas as a as a web comic. So that was a whole other journey, and then started putting it together, running Kickstarter campaigns, and then last year I thought, what am I doing? Like I'm two comics in. So there's two comics. They're color comics, and they're the main story. So they echo the main story in the in the novel. Um, but I thought there's like. 10 years of history of her so she's a she's a bounty hunter that, that works for the bureau basically hunting down what they call remade individuals so people that are vampires vorgan and lesser things the the quick backstory is the demon moon rises 30 years ago so there's this red moon that rises it hangs in the air for 30 days or so and while that's up there it causes absolute chaos you know earthquakes floods fire the whole thing fire and brimstone that whole thing and a certain a small percentage of the population of earth uh, manifests these sort of inner traits and vampires and, and those sorts of things start to emerge. And these, these uh, hybrids that are called mancers, which is just another word for magic. So blood mancers and ether mancers and all this. So they have the ability to manipulate certain things and do magic effectively. So the post uh, demon moon world uh, is a world where the mundanes are the vast majority, but they kind of hide themselves away in walled enclaves and buildings and all that sort of stuff. Uh, whereas the others hide underground or, you know, keep to themselves or whatever. But then whenever the, the demon moon periodically reappears, all the nasties come out and all the mundanes hide and they get their security guards with the machine guns standing out front just to keep the riffraff at bay. So it's this real divided um, society. Um, and, as part of that, uh, Summer, the main character, she's a shadow mancer, which is the rarest of the rarest of the rare. No one knows of anyone else that's a shadow mancer. So someone that can bend shadow and make it a physical, you know, force, either, you know, a weapon or a shield. The only other um, known shadow mancer was a, um, a mass murderer that lived 10 years ago. So, and he was captured and all the rest of it, but that that's, you know, heavy in the consciousness of, of people. So when they see her and they see her start to manipulate shadow, they're, they're already freaked out because they're thinking back to that horrific sort of time, but also like she, they know she's incredibly powerful. Um, so her whole thing is she's out really, it's about money for her. So she, she obviously gets an amount, every, every bounty that she brings and everything. She works with the bureau, but she doesn't work in the bureau. It's or that kind of thing where I'll yeah. take your money, but I don't want to be part of your 
bureaucratic organization. I just want to do my thing. I want to, you know, get the kicking boots on and get out there and bring in as many as I can. And so the, the, the main story is essentially her going out on the town at night to do this when the demon moon, moon rises, but her handler from the bureau comes in and says, no, 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 you're not going to do that. I have an urgent job. You need to take it now. You don't have a choice. If you ever want to get money from us again, you need to do this. She's upset. She has to do it. She does it. And the gig is essentially, we need you to track this guy down. All we have on him is a blurry tattoo uh, and you need to find him ASAP. What, what has he done? Uh, he hasn't done anything yet. Okay, so you need me to bring someone in. All you've got is a blurry Polaroid of a tattoo that I can't quite see. Uh, and I've got to bring this guy in for not doing anything. Yeah, that's it. And then off she goes. And then the whole story is essentially, how do you make someone that is so powerful and strong and feared and systematically strip that away from her? And then what does that mean for her and the people that she loves and all that sort of stuff? So that's, that's the main story. But then I realized I'm starting that story and she's already, you know, like the first Star Wars movie. It's already running. There's, there's no back history. So I thought, why don't I write a, a bunch of standalone episodes from her previous life as a bounty hunter when she's just starting out and all that sort of stuff's going on. And I'll do it in black and white or, or, and gray tones for two genius reasons, which I only found out were genius later on. So the first uh, genius reason is... Um, it, it's aesthetically really cool because the present is all in color and the past mm. is in black and white. So it's like a memory in a, in a film sort of sense. The second, even more ingenious thing is that cost. it's like a quarter of the cost. <laughs> yeah, it's so cheap to do them, which means I could do four standalone comics for the price of one color one. And I thought surely people would want, I would want, I would want to get four times the amount of value out of, out of the thing and the stories. And so that's- Let me give you a third- if I yes, may, I'll say it. Uh, yeah. at least this is maybe not a reason, but justification, if nothing else, is it's manga. If you're if you're in a manga yeah. tradition, you know, manga's not not uh colored. And and this was the first time where I've got manga artists and exactly that and said, do the thing that you do. The only difference is obviously we read Western style instead of the other way. Um but that was really cool as well, because as I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, yeah, the way they arrange the panels, the movement, the angles and everything, very different to traditional comics, um, mm. which was so, so interesting to explore with the, the world and the characters. And, um, and actually, so as part of this campaign, one of the uh, tiers that I had was you can join this universe as a writer if you want. Um, you basically buy in and you start writing and, and three of them got picked up really quickly, um, which well, I wasn't I was gonna expecting. Ask, yeah, I was going to ask about that tier, um, actually, um, if, if we could explore that more, because, I mean, it's very, uh, I mean, it's very generous of people to fund it, but it's also very generous of you um, to uh, allow people to partake in your creative journey. And like, where did that idea come from? Is, is it original to you? Did you see it somewhere else? Um, how did you decide to go that route? Cause it is so uh, unique. Um, I, I haven't, so I haven't seen anyone else that's doing it. They, they might be, and they might've been doing it for years. I, I've not seen it, certainly not on Kickstarter. Um, I tried it on my last campaign and didn't get any bites, but I thought for this one, ah, eh, I'll, I'll give it a shot. You never know. Wasn't expecting anything. Um, but for me, it's a win-win because, so what are we, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I'm 10. That's not 10. How did I get that? That's 10. Okay, <laughs> man. Uh, For so, listeners, uh, Morgan counted. I saw nine fingers out. <laughs> yes, yeah, like I had my thumb hidden for some reason. <laughs> Uh, so I'm 10, 10 issues in altogether. Uh, there's only six in this campaign, but there's four more that are underway or that are you know nearing completion. Um, so that's 10 different stories. Um, that's a lot of work and a lot of thinking and all that sort of stuff. So part of me is excited to sort of give some of that responsibility for thinking of a cool new story to someone else's brain. Um, and immediately the, the two, two of the three that I've already spoke, actually I've spoken to all three, but the two, that I've spoken to in a bit more detail have already come up with suggestions of things that I've never would have thought of 
that I think, wow, that is such a cool thing to explore in this world. I, I wouldn't have even occurred to me. There's so many possibilities. So there's that. It's an immediate benefit to me because I don't have to do the uh, heavy lifting you know, of thinking of story. It's a real benefit to them because it's a known um, property. Uh, I've done this for years now and th there's processes in place. We've got the artist in place. I'll be working with them. I'll be editing. I'll be doing the lettering on the comics and all that sort of stuff. So it's all done so they can have confidence. It will eventuate and become a, a thing. Um, the other thing is I keep announcing this on podcasts, but I haven't even announced it in updates on the thing yet. Anyway, I've, I've realized the other day that I've got it on my website. So, so keeping it a secret is just dumb. Anyway, uh, so the, the whole, um, God, I was going to say franchise, that makes it sound super important. Let's go with it. The whole franchise uh, is, uh, has been picked up by Mycosia, which is a UK uh, publisher. So after the campaign awesome. finishes, all of the books will be available worldwide. Um, so that again, for, for a prospective writer means you get a, a co-writing credit on a piece of work that's going to be available worldwide, part of a franchise with, by the time they're done, 13 you know, or more uh, books. Um, so there's a lot of appeal there. There's a kind of safety thing for someone to sort of dip their toe in the water and get involved in the process without the risk of... Um, having to pay for everything and so it's kind of like a almost like buying a share or, or a few shares or buying a, a, a portion of the story the other thing is i i it, so the the deal is for an eight page comic there's i can't do an eight page comic there's got to be more there's got to be more value so i've spoken to all three of the backers and said look in reality it's going to be 22 to, to 40 pages per comic so it'll be a proper story i'll cover the cost for the rest of that um you know, which is means even more value for them. So they're not just getting a little sort of thing. They're actually getting a, a full book, which gives them a chance to just explore a decent story. Um, and it's good for me as well, because that's more of Shadow's Daughter out there in the world. There's more buy-in from people. So we'll see how it goes, but I'm, I'm so excited. The, the other thing is writing tends to be a very um, solo activity. So I'm yeah. just excited to be exploring the universe with other people and getting their ideas and yeah it's great it's real win-win and a really big surprise um yeah that people grab that yeah it's yeah cool. yeah i was surprised to see it as an offering i think that's so original and um yeah i mean well thought out obviously you you have a lot of you wouldn't have put it out there if you didn't think it through or maybe you would have but uh i think it has yeah. <laughs> It, yeah, it's going to work out really well for you. And all those reasons jive with me. I mean, I, I write as well a bit. And um, yeah, sometimes mm -hmm. I, one of the reasons for starting this podcast was to have a creative outlet that wasn't entirely uh, siloed by myself. And I, the nature of the podcast is I need some guests. So yeah, that's great. <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, as a viewer and, you know, someone now on the podcast it, it it it's so cathartic being able to talk to someone like you and go back and forward and kind of get into some of the nitty-gritty of the process and everything it, it just makes you feel less alone and isolated which is kudos to you um and those of your ilk that that you know run podcasts and those sorts of things yeah, yeah. it's really beneficial to, to us creatives for sure yeah even even just for me as the host and a fellow creative you know i end the podcast with little like sign-offs takeaways and it's always kind of like oh i'm so motivated by this person thank you <laughs> thank you <laughs> guest number one two three one through 43 i think this is the 43rd episode if i'm counting right um nice yeah so is is there an end in sight for this particular story it, it seems like it's uh like you said a huge universe you have a tendency to to get into stories where you're creating you know coming from an epic fantasy background which is like uh is lord of the rings an epic fantasy i'm not super yeah yeah that's familiar a, with the genre but like yeah. huge worlds that surround uh, a few characters that you're writing about at that given moment but recognizing that a lot of other stories are happening in and around them at any given time um and that's your background so for shadow's daughter um, 
you already have some spinoffs and, and are moving in other directions, but for the main story, do you have the end in your head? And if you do, do you know how many issues before you get there? So in reverse uh, answer or answering in reverse. Um, so yes, I, I know uh, exactly where this arc story arc ends is a very sort of definitive end because it's based on the novel, which is great. So it means I've already got a, a, a oh, plan mapped out. Yeah. So I'm, um, that's really nice because I won't get too lost. Hopefully I can, I can see where I've got to get to. Um, the next one is a bit tricky though. I, I think it's either two or three more color comics to get to the end of this. So it would either be a, a four or a five comic run Having said that, they're all, you know, 50, 60 pages, the color ones. So in, in normal comic terms, it's probably about 15 odd comics. It's, it's a longer sort of thing. But uh, so in the, the size of the books that I'm doing, I think another two, I think two would, would get there. But I don't know. I, I have to <laughs> see now I'm already thinking I have to write those scripts uh, and then I have to talk to the artists. That, yeah, there's all those things. But um. But yeah, so it, it, I'd say within the next uh, year or so, um, year or two, that main story will be complete. There'll be a lot more side issues. Uh, and some of those side issues are connected as well. So there's kind of a, a threat, to, not a threat, a thread to, to one or two of the stories within there that I wouldn't mind exploring. Um, yeah, but as to an end, because the, I mean, the, this is the problem with writing novels. As soon as I finish that novel, I've, I've immediately started the next one, um, but stopped because of other projects. But I, 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 just about every novel that I write ends with a, not necessarily a click cliffhanger, but definitely, uh, okay, there's a partial resolution, but there's even a bigger, badder, worse thing coming. So now you need to, you know, because it hooks readers and that's what interests me and all that. And I, I love the thought of just continuing on even though it's exhausting. So yes, what that means, I don't know. So I don't really see an end after this first story arc, but there's a definite end of that story arc. So I'll probably have to evaluate it when we get to that point and decide what on earth to do when we get to that point. Um, you know, <laughs> we'll see. Someone, even yesterday, someone was uh, uh, talking to me and, and made a few suggestions. <laughs> and, and I thought, oh God, that stuff I haven't even, even like, special issues that are holiday related, you know, uh, like a Valentine's issue, you know, what well, you could go stuff. back to the roots, the origins, you in the cafe working yeah. on your romance novel. And then instead of, <laughs> yeah. instead of a shadow mancer, you could have a romancer, a romancer. And then they could, you know, the romancer could meet up with a bromancer, you know, he's just <laughs> the dude kind of character. Uh, this, uh, this, it's one of those things that it, it's so open and there's so much, and there's, I've only really explored some aspects of one character, the main character. There are three other characters, key characters that I haven't even started exploring. So yeah, there's a lot, but it'll come down to costs and funding and, you know, artist availability and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, definitely for the next few years, I can't see it finishing anytime soon. Yeah, it's, that's exciting. Um, on the on the note about you know further developing characters and exploring characters, one note I took out of one of the um, Kickstarter campaigns is that you enjoy writing introspection, um, mm. and so I wonder about how you go about that, um, and then specifically as it pertains to summer. Uh, who is the main character of um, of your current project? Yeah, so I, I, I uh, as I said earlier, this book, the or the Shadow's Daughter, the original novel, which hasn't hasn't been released yet, but will probably come out this year, or we'll see. Um, uh, that was my first experience at writing in first person present. Um, which is tricky because it, right. you, you run the danger of being, I'm doing this, now I'm doing that, now I'm doing this now. And it, it reads like a four-year-old has written it, you know, it, it, you know, very, yeah, yeah. so you've got to be very inventive with ways. But what I loved about it is, again, I love expansive sci-fi or, you know, alternate worlds. It's my jam. I love that stuff. 
but they're exhaustive to exhausting to write. So my thought is you have that world set up, but the actual narrative you write in first person present, which narrows it right down into that person's head. So you're reading from their perspective and it closes down the narrative so much. So there have been so many times in, in the last four or five books I've written where I think, oh, okay, now I need to go to this other character. And then you think, no, I can't do that. Unless the protagonist meets that character, I can't reveal anything about them. So you're just tied to this individual. And I really love that pressure between being tied so narrowly to this one character who is walking around in this massive, expansive, well thought out kind of world um, that, that really appeals to me. So that's what I've been writing for the last few years is that, that style. And in terms of summer in, uh, specifically, I love a protagonist that defies expectation. So I love the idea of her being relatively young, small, you know, fairly petite frame and just having this enormous amount of power, like, like you know, Titanic mm. kind of power within her, but also that she knows it and doesn't really care because yeah, I'll, I'll use it to get what I want. But what I want is to get paid so that I can pay rent and so that I can get the new bike that I want to get. And, you know, so she's also this kind of disinterested in the, like, she's not going to take over the world. She's not going to use her power for that. She's just, you know, uh, almost like this mercenary kind of way of viewing the world. And a lot um, of people probably, I, I think it's interesting because you would expect a mercenary to be, power hungry and maybe, maybe, you know, leverage those powers to their fullest per potential. But it sounds like in a disinterested way, she's just living the yeah. life she wants to live. Yeah. And I think it, again, it's part of her, it's what I was, obviously some of this comes from me. It's what I said before. I don't want to join a group. You know, she, she doesn't want to be in a clan. She doesn't want, she resists bureaucracy and being, labeled and all of that and i think part of that is not using her gift to start a cult or to you know dominate the world mm. because that would just be too much work and so boring and not interesting at all um so that's what what really drives her and the thing about uh, the mercenary side of things is they will fight while they're getting paid and they will give up if if the stakes get too now, this is me making a lot of assumptions about things, but that's one of the things I liked when I, when I was looking at the whole mercenary thing for another thing is it's not the same as I will live and die in this land because my forefathers were here and all that. It, it is, I'm getting paid to do this job. If things go really bad, well, why would I stick around? I'm in it for the paycheck. So I'm a professional, but I'm also, I know when things tip and I'm going to, you can have your money and I'm out. And so right. there's that aspect as well, where it's like, yeah, I'm in it and I'm a pro and I know what I'm doing. But if it goes south, I'm going to survive. I'm not going to sacrifice myself for some bureau or some government agency or whatever. Um, the interesting thing then, of course, with Summer's character as things progress is she absolutely gets put in the place where her, she is on the line and the few people that she actually does care about are on the line. So she has to invest in this thing, even though everything in her just resists that she, she kind of has to, she doesn't have a choice which is really cool. And in terms of the inner, I, I like the inner voice. I love smart mouth characters and she's definitely that. And I love being able to say things through a character that, that I would like to say, but I would never be able to say in public. So there's a bit of that <laughs> going on. And there are a few um, women that I've worked with over the years that some of them, literally their voice is, is coming through. There's an example I give of, um, so the start of the story, is about it's stupidly mundane, which I love. So she's uh, lost her jeans and then is very, very upset with her um, apartment, um, uh, Tammy, who, who lives with her in the apartment, um, uh, saying, where are my jeans? What have you done with my jeans? And then Tammy says, well, I, I washed them. They were beginning to stink. And Summer gets outraged because how dare you? You've washed the comfy out of them. They're, they're just the way I like them. Yes, they might stink a little, but they're perfect for what I want. Don't wash my, don't ever wash my jeans. And this whole thing happens. And then immediately you move on to the next one. And she says, where are my boots? And then her boots are at the front door, all polished and neat and shiny. 
and and the same thing she's all right because no no that they, they need to be scuffed they need to be I, I walk around in the shadows i don't want to be shining reflecting light of you know so it's this wonderfully mundane kind of thing which that comes from a real life uh uh conversation i've had had with a friend um it, sound, it sounds she, pretty like real as as hilarious as it is it's it's exactly her words were but why do you wash jeans? You don't need to wash jeans. You just hang them up. And, and that, that just struck me as like, what? What do you mean? She said, yeah, jeans don't. They're fine. You just, you just hang them up. And you're fine. But that just stuck with me. And I thought, wow, that, that's exactly what Summer would, would do. Um, you know, she's got vampire blood and all that sort of stuff, stains on them and everything. But it's like, but they're, they're just how I want them, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, some of it has come from people I've spoken to. And some of it is there's a lot of catharsis in it as well, being a love, like I said, a character with a smart mouth who even when everything is stripped away and they're losing and they're facing death um, head on, they, there's a thing inside them that cannot help being a smart ass. Even in that dire circumstance, they're going to say the stupid thing that's going to mean it's going to get worse, but they can't help because it's some measure of victory they can achieve by just kind of getting the last word in. And that's, yeah, that's kind of, that's summer. That's well said and obviously a very well and deeply explored um, character. I could I could tell that you have a fondness for her that goes beyond just writing words on a page, which is, you know, a sign that the character in the story is as deep as the Kickstarter uh, indicates. So I'm excited to check it out. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's, yeah, she's. Yeah, it, it's it's soppy to say, but that they become living people, and yeah, it's yeah, I, I'd love to meet her, but also be very scared and probably not want to meet her. But <laughs> I'd like to see her from a distance and go, yeah, she's awesome, but I don't want to get too close. <laughs> yeah, um, you have so many other projects that came up when I was um, looking into your portfolio, um, super serious comics which is a mm -hmm. website and the, I guess the uh, publishing company that you put the comics out under, if I'm not mistaken. Um, mm -hmm. Enmity, Idle Thuggery, Whiplash, Rust Chronicles, City of Ruin, uh, Twiggy of the Bug. Um, are there any of those that you wanna mention, talk about, explore, reminisce on? Um, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll probably focus on the key, the key one. So there is, so the Shadow's Daughter uh, uh, franchise um, is uh, is great, and that's evolving, and there's, I'm really looking forward to that. Compared to Rust Chronicles, that's that's a little baby that's just been born. Rust Chronicles is much bigger, much more expansive. There are six novels written at the moment that will be released as the as the year goes on. So Whiplash is the first novel of that series. Um, this is one of those, one, there's a short story volume coming out soon with artwork as well, which kind of pitches the world. Um, it has stories from, uh, so novels from the perspective of five or six of the main characters and then, you know, going backwards and forwards in time. Uh, the, the whole series revolves around this dream city. So the idea is that there is, this world of dreams, which is fabricated or made up from the substance of when we dream. So if I dream and I dream of Brisbane city that I'm walking around in the city or something, or someone else is in Los Angeles and they dream that they're in the middle of LA, you know, during the day or whatever, the fabric of what they're dreaming about, the substance adds to this dream world and makes a shadowy kind of representation of that city within that, that world. So it's kind of like this other plane where those things happen. And the whole uh, Rust Chronicles kind of uh, world revolves around this central city called Rust or nicknamed Rust. And it's called that because of the, the, walled, uh, the wall around it is made from a mixture of um, rusted iron and wood and, you know, that sort of thing. So it's that, got that orange rust kind of look. So that people just call it Rust. They can't remember what the original name. And that's the only thing in this whole dream world which has been stable since everyone can remember. So it actually exists as a real place and people sometimes dream themselves in there and they get stuck and then they can't 
leave and they their bodies die in the real world and they live on in this this world from all different eras and all that sort of stuff so it's it's essentially a story about a city in the middle of rebellion against uh this red queen character and her sort of cadre of demigods basically that that rule over this sort of area uh the city's caught in rebellion and it's exploring different um characters within that that are part of the rebellion people that aren't the book whiplash deals with uh one of the uh, a, a, a young kid basically an 18 year old that just gets sucked into this world without any clue what's going on and he finds himself right at the center of this whole thing so the whiplash story is probably the central story that takes people right through it but then there's all these other sort of things so again if you're a fan of expansive worlds but also stories that move very quickly uh characters that kind of some of my, the my favorite characters are, are in that whole series um that's probably the big um franchise that uh that i've invested more than anything else in over the years and there's so many, and again that that one's picked up by marcosia so there'll be things dropping every uh, every year now on that um that's, but yeah that's that, so cool and is that going to stay in novel uh form or is there a plan to also do comics on that front as well well so i have a a, a graphic <laughs> dare i ask you dare you ask uh you dare uh yeah so i have a graphic novella called the script rebellion which is already out on on the amazons and elsewhere um so the script rebellion that's a short story turned into a graphic novella uh from that whole universe so that's out there are there's a comic version of whiplash which is very close very very close uh so i, I i'm debating whether there's a kickstarter there or whether i just release it straight away or that's sort a of thing there's also uh, a, a comic called the blood below which is a kind of detective crime sort of thing in the same world but from a different angle that will be out this year um and in fact uh oh, how do i do this well anyone hit me up anyone that's listening to this if you back the campaign send me a message and say hey i was listening to what's your random and i backed the campaign let me know and you will get an exclusive free copy digital copy of the blood below which has not even been released yet. Awesome. Um, so the answer is yes, they're, they're going to be in comic form and some of them are, uh, it's just when they get released um, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's kind of like a multimedia approach, I guess you're not going to, you can't summate a whole novel series or series of novels into a few comics, but you could supplement and overlap and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. Yeah, ex yeah, ex exactly. The, there's got to be a few individual th plot threads and then, but they all kind of link the, the short story volume, which is going to be called um, uh, Rust Chronicles uh, volume one. That's probably, that's coming out soonish. That that's probably a good place to start once that comes out, because that introduces you to the whole world, some of the main characters and um, some of the key concepts. So it really sort of grounds you in the world, but whiplash, which is out now uh, is probably, the best narrative story to to get you know introduced into the world because you're basically following the main character as he gets dropped in it so it's kind of a bit of a shock um yeah but that that's that's my um i mean i love everything that i'm doing but that that's the that's where my heart really lies with the whole rust chronicles thing yeah and how long ago did you write the write those uh it was before shadow's daughter i mean it might be 13 14 years or something like that um it was a while ago but the that first it was a, it was a painting i saw oh god i'm not going to be able to remember the painting it was a painting from okay surrealist painter massive in the, the 20th century big mu curly mustache um feel free to uh, <laughs> <laughs> not that you need my permission um uh, i'm absolutely there we go D dali salvador dali of course um so it was a painting that he did and it was it's one of his one of his paintings that's not surreal at all i can't even remember what it's called but it's a picture of a desert and it's got a little town you can just see in the distance and there's this little uh sort of horse buggy running towards the the thing 
can't remember what it's called, but I saw that as I was looking through Dali paintings for something else. It might've been an assignment at, at um, college or something like that. I can't remember, but I was looking through, saw that. And I just thought that that is such a cool idea. This city, this lone city in the middle of a desert with nothing else around. And that's where the idea of rust came from, but it was kind of like, but it's more in a, if there was a city on Mars, what would that look like? You know, that sort of red stone, red dust everywhere. Then the whole dream thing came in and all that sort of stuff. But it, it, it started by just seeing an image of Dali's painting and thinking that's a really cool idea. And then everything kind of the went inception from there, of yeah. the idea as, as indeed, a, again, the introduction to the podcast says and like what's the environment in which you start with that impetus that catalyst you saw a painting it inspired you how you know what is the time frame what are the circumstances what are the surroundings what is your activity in which that little drop in a pool of mm. water ripples out and echoes to allow you to have all these uh you know precipitating ideas and the evolution of, of, of the whole, I mean, you created a world essentially, like let's sum it and make it really like <laughs> say it in really kind of stupid terms. You created a world from seeing a, a image. Yeah. Well, okay. We're, we're going to dig a little deeper as well. So I, I found out last year that I have this thing called aphantasia, which they've only just recently named which is essentially, so if, if you close your eyes and I say, think of an apple, you can see a, an image of an apple. I close my eyes and say, think of an apple. I just see black. I have no visual uh, imagination at all. And I found out it's, it's, it's rare, but it's not extremely rare. A lot of other, actually a, um, a podcast that I listened to, a comedy podcast, um, Richard Herring from the UK, he was the first one I heard mention it. He was talking to a friend and saying, oh, think, think about, you know, this or that. And he's saying, I can't, what do you mean think about it? I, I can't. So anyway, that's how I found out. So uh, that has just revolutionized the way I've thought about my, my life history <laughs> from now on, because I realized, A, why I'm bad at things like visual maths and, uh, or mathematics and those sorts of things. Um, and it explains why when my wife is trying to explain you know, how she wants to change the kitchen to look a different way that I have no, unless she draws it, I cannot picture at all what she's talking about, which has caused many arguments. Um, but we understand have the, now. Have the arguments subsided since the day? They, they, have, they have subsided, but she still can't comprehend <laughs> what it's like. She still, part of her thinks, still thinks I'm lying, I think. Um, <laughs> but it, it's, if you look it up, it's a real thing, aphantasia. And it, it I think that is why, because when I close my eyes, I, I I can't see anything. I can still represent ideas, but they're not visual. It's really, really weird. And I'm still struggling to uh, understand and explain it. But I think that's why I'm drawn to the visual or part of the reason why I'm drawn to visual arts and part of the reason why I'll see an image like that and it will throw up so many things. Um, the problem is even now, I can't see that image in my head. I can't bring that painting back to me. I remember it and I remember the details in it, but I can't visually represent it. So in answer to your question, the what first is the, thing I do. Yeah, I don't know if you could answer this, but what is the memory like? Is it uh, some sort of description or, um, you know? The way I would describe it, and again, this is completely inadequate to, to what's going on. So let's say you're trying to mime uh, a picture of a house. Uh, so you're, you're in front of me, uh, there's a sheet, a, a black um, bed sheet between you and me, you're behind that sheet, there's a light there and you're mimicking it. We turn the light off, you move up to the sheet and you press your hands against it in the shape of a kind of house just to try and get that image there. But I know you're doing it but I can't see anything. All I see is black, but I know what you're doing. I know there's an image of a house there. I just can't see it. That's as close as I can get to representing what's going on. Fascinating. Very yeah, thank weird. You for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's all there, but I don't have access to it, but it's still definitely there because how, how would I imagine anything if there wasn't something going on? Um, yeah, and like dreaming a, is another interesting one as well. Cause I, I dream vivid dreams. But again, if I try and remember any of them, there's it's just black. 
but I can remember details, but not visually anything. Um, and on a, on a sadder note, um, and shout out to all the aphantasics out there. Um, I've never, I can't picture my mother's face, my father's face, my siblings, my son, my wife. I, I can't remember those details and bring them to mind. I can remember them all, you know, emotionally and all that stuff, but I can't bring sure. it a simple image of my, you know, my mother's face or something to, which is, again, so I think that's kind of propelled me a little bit to be attracted to these visual images and artists and general and all that sort of stuff. And so the first thing I'll do when I get that idea is I'll be upstairs uh, with one of these. So for those that can't see, it's a, you know, uh, just a notebook um a nice a and, nice notebook looks like a, a, a moleskin nice or something similar it looks like that it's a, it's the cheap knockoff version uh of of that I have and it those looks too. like it's leather bound <laughs> but it's uh it's faux leather bound um yeah and i'll just start drawing um uh, images really badly but you know images um pointing to things writing down ideas names of what am i going to call these creatures what am i going to call these people what sort of society do they have? Where do they come from? How does this work? And you essentially start problem solving all of the issues around plot and the societies that exist there. And then as soon as I've got enough, which is usually not long, it doesn't take long because the, the ideas just pour out. I'll just start writing. So I'll start writing a novel or a short story or something. And then as I'm writing the novel, I think, oh, I, I need a backstory for this thing. So then I'll go back to the pad and start sketching out and and then I'll go back to the novel. So it's kind of like it starts with that initial um, just dropping everything on a page and then you move to putting it in a narrative form and that helps you bring everything together in a logical way that makes sense. And then you go back and, and it just goes, just sort of spirals from there. And then you've got to think, all right, once I have one story end to end and I can see the world, who am I writing about next and what? what areas am I exploring and what's too big to explore and what's what's cool enough that it's going to be really interesting, but I can also kind of do it justice. And, and also I, I just, I love the idea of rebellion. I love the idea of an unjust kind of ruler and a rebellious city, but, I, but even more than that, a failed rebellion, because that's, that's the juicy stuff. That's mm -hmm. you, you don't want to read about just that's success, bittersweet. success, success. Yeah, you want to read about heartbreak and failure and love lost and so yeah, so that that's and the silver lining, but you know, you wish you you wish you could see the sun or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, that sounds beautiful. So you have like so many projects, so many ideas, and we talked about the Phoenix and the octopus, and mm -hmm. you know, if you're eighty percent octopus or or whatever. Um, I wonder how you manage as an octopus um, to not get your tentacles in a bunch and, and keeping things yeah. organized and, um, you know, not being able to switch gears. Like you talked about, if you get bored with one project, you have another project you could switch to. How do you switch gears without burning your transmission? Uh, well, switching, switching gears is actually the easiest thing for me because I, I do find I'll burn out on a project and get to the point where it becomes hard work or I've just, I've reached a natural end or a blocking point and I need to just do something else. So I will shift. Um, but usually that's shifting medium as well. So I'll shift from a novel to a comic or from either to music and then shift back because it's creative and it's fun and I love it, but it's different enough that it's, um, it's like taking a break from the hard work that I'm doing on the other, other project. Occasionally I used to write sort of two novels at once and swap between them, but I've stopped doing that recently because it's just <laughs> the ideas get too intertwined and intermingled and I get confused between them. It's like learning two languages. It's just, I was just so now I that. focus yeah. on one. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely is. Um, uh, so I focus on one and then get to the end of that one and then decide, all right, I'm going to swap over to another one. So, so currently I have four, three, three novels, which need editing, uh, one that I'm desperate to get back to and start editing. Um, but I can't because I have to finish the one that I'm doing now, 
while I've got it in my head, because once it's done, I'll have to then re-edit and reread the whole book just to remember where I'm at, at and where all the characters are at. And so better to finish it off now, end it with that one and then move on to the next one. And, and as, as to the tangling uh, of tentacles, um, yeah, it, it's more keeping things straight is, is um, my day job. I, I, this is what I do. I fix problems and I uh, use spreadsheets and organize and structure. It's all about bringing structure to chaos. That's mm. essentially what I, it's one of the things that I, it's with music as well. I'm a much better um, producer than I am a musician because that's about bringing all of these different things together making them logical, making them work, you know, all that sort of stuff. That That's that's the thing that I do uh, well. Um, so I don't struggle so much with that. What I struggle with is being overwhelmed every now and then with just the sheer volume mm. of all of the projects and also two completely contradictory things. Um, one being the sheer volume of everything and the other being the voice of my super ego saying, you're not doing enough. What are you doing? You're not going to get anywhere if you don't produce. You need to do more. You need to do more. You need to do better. You need to do quicker. You should have already released 15 novels. Why haven't you done that? You know, it's that super critical voice that drives me, but never shuts up. Just nothing. is So, so I have this mantra that I keep repeating to myself again and again. The, the better version of it is the um, progress, not perfection which is the, that's the nice one. The one that I, I go with is brick by brick. Just that's how you build a kingdom brick by brick. So today, if I build one brick, which might be appearing on this awesome podcast, it might be writing, you know, a thousand words or 500 words or something, just one, one thing that adds to the whole, then I've done my job and we're moving and that's enough. That's great. And you try and trick yourself in thinking, so you can be quiet now, super ego. You don't need to tell me that I haven't done enough and that I, it's not good enough and all the rest of that. And yeah, I've forgotten where we started with this. No, I, appreciate, I, I might remember, but I, I would love to vibe on this at least a little bit longer to at, at a minimum say, this reminds me of a conversation I had with Jeff Johnson who writes uh, epic fans, uh, fantasy and he oh, said cool. the best advice somebody gave him recently or kind of a mantra was slow down. Um, yeah. And yeah, I really appreciate you allowing um, your super ego out for a moment to share with you that voice in your head with us, uh, at me as a host and with the listeners, because uh, I think we all have that super ego and sometimes it runs me into the ground and I'm a Phoenix who burns out because of it before the projects even come to fruition. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and yeah. so the, you know, the brick by brick um, mantra, I think is, is an important one to, to harness and to help uh, quell and, and keep that super ego at bay. Thank you for sharing, sharing that. Yeah. You're, you're welcome. It's, it's how you keep saying when you, when you're doing this sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And I think it perfectly uh, answers the, the question, which was about, um, you know, keeping on schedule, not getting your tentacles in a bunch and not part of that is not feeling overwhelmed when some tentacles get in a bunch and yeah. you realize you have, you know, four of your eight arms are tied up in knots and you can't figure out which one to untie first. Yeah. To continue. Yeah, exactly. the <laughs> um, yeah. You, you may have answered this question in answering the previous question. Um, but I wonder how you switch it's, it's again, switching gears, but to better illustrate the question, if I stay away from a project for a period of time, and then I come back, I kind of have this trouble getting back into the flow of that project, getting my mind into that universe. And you have, you know, built epic universes, worlds in your own mind. So how do you knock on the door to that proverbial world 
and allow yourself back in um, to, again, mm-hmm. write for specific characters in a specific setting with its own uh, guardrails and rules that are specific to that environment. Uh, yes. Yeah, so this is a lot easier with comics than it is with novels because the, the short answer is I'll read or reread or re-edit the last thing I wrote. Um, so a good example. So I'm up to book four of Whiplash. So I'm halfway through writing that one. And I took a break from that to write a couple of extra novels and a separate sort of thing. Um, and I know roughly where it's up to, but there's so many intricate details uh, and it's four, box, four books in. So a lot has happened that I need to remember. But I, I tend to find if I read the latest uh, book in the series, I tend to remember very quickly what's happened because there, there are hints sort of laced throughout the or woven throughout the right, story right. that remind me of, oh, that's right, that one is dead or this one you know, has this thing inside them that they're not sure what that is yet. Or I haven't referenced the uh, abyssal brood yet in this chapter or what, you know, there's all those sorts of things. Um, so it tends to come up quick, but honestly, uh, when it gets to the size of the um, uh, Rust Chronicles universe in particular, I have a spreadsheet that has a chapter summary of everything. Uh, and then I have a sort of glossary of the main terms and things and all that sort of stuff. And, and even when I'm writing a novel at the bottom of the novel, I'll have a, a uh, explanatory notes as I'm writing because I'll forget as I'm writing and I'll, I'll get on a bit and I'll think have I used this before and I'll go down oh yeah I've used it before so then I have to go back <laughs> just to keep it straight and then of course you delete it with the final version but it's just to keep yeah but honestly spreadsheets with a lot of information and a in the case of um, Rust Chronicles a very very complicated timeline of what happens when not only what happens with the main characters, but which books are located at which point in history, because that gets super complicated. Um, but yeah, that's essentially it. I just, I reread and sometimes I'll start rereading and I'll think, no, I'm not ready for this yet. It's just, it's too much. I'm going to just leave that parked for a bit and go into something else because you remember just how much is involved or you just don't feel the spark. You don't. Now I'm in a privileged position, uh, privileged of not having a publisher that's hounding me. I don't have a traditional big publisher, one of the big four or three or however many they are. And I, so they're not hounding me and saying, you need to get, get us this book within six months or whatever. Um, I'll still write a book, you know, every, um, you know, three or four months but I can go wherever I want. So that that's really freeing. Cause I can just, whatever's most interesting to me at the moment, I'll just go. It's still a slog to get through it. Um, and re- the, the last one that I just um, finished off, which is called the seven hungers, which is kind of a horror adventure kind of thing. Um, yeah. I got to 70,000 words, which is 20,000 shy of what it needs to be to be a, the size that I want. But I know when I go back and edit, I'll fill those details out. And it was hard. And I'm not even sure of the ending. I, I, I'm not happy with it. I'm not. So I've got to go right back to the start. And now I'm re-editing and filling in things because I know that when I get there, I will think of something else or different or I'll add to it or I'll get there and I'll go, you know what? That is a really good ending. I just forgot that it, that, that works. Um, but that it's harder work every time you have to do it because it's like, yeah you're going over the same ground again and again. And uh, so there is a lot of hard work involved, which any any creator knows, you know, there's, there's a lot of pushing through and uh, for me tricking myself. So my, my greatest trick is I'm just going to read a paragraph. That's all. Or I'm just going to write a paragraph. I'm not going to do a a few chapters, just going to, because when you start, and you push through and then all of a sudden you're in and you're doing it and you're fine. You just got to get to that initial thing. Uh, a and, if, and if you don't I push am. through and you, and you don't hit that spark, then you try again tomorrow, 10 minutes or one yeah. paragraph. And even so, even if you've written a sentence, you still wrote a sentence. You still did something. Right. Um, there's a, a philosopher named um, Slavoj Žižek. Um, who's he, he writes a, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of books, He's prolific. Um, and his whole thing, I remember seeing, he has a, a little tiny desk with his computer set up on it and it's a standing desk. And he just has it in the corner of his room. 
And that's how he tricks himself into writing books. He'll just say, oh, I'm just going to write a paragraph and he'll go over and then four hours will go by and he's written three chapters. And, you know, uh, that's where I got the idea from. I thought, that's a great idea. Just, just, just trick yourself. And if it works, great. If it doesn't, no, that's all right. You know, just wrote a sentence or two. Yes. I don't, I don't know if I told this story on the podcast before. I don't think I have because it's so weird and specific, but um, I wrestled growing up and there was this guy who I've ne- I never actually met him or saw him, but at some wrestling camps or seminars or something like that, he would say, and this is a imitation that my friends would do who interacted with this guy one or once or twice. All you have to do is practice 15 minutes a day. And basically <laughs> it was you practice 15 minutes a day for your whole life and you are a Olympian freestyle yeah, yeah. wrestler, something like that. And so it applies yeah. to writing as well. All you have to do is sit down in front of your computer and write 15 sentences a day or four 15 minutes. Just put your fingers on the keyboard and, and let her rip and you'll have a it's, book it's, in X just consistency. That's exactly yeah. right. It's all about consistency. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's spot on. But some days you just don't. Yeah. I know though, but the, most writers are like this. I think if, if I don't, if I miss a day and I don't write, I feel terrible. I feel like I've, for me, it's the, the equivalent of going to gym or yoga or, you know, those other things people do for mindfulness and everything like that. If, if I right. miss the opportunity. So I'm fine now because uh, at five o'clock this morning, I, I uh, was able to edit two chapters and that's my requirement when I'm editing. So that's, I'm done for the day, which means everything's great. But if I miss it, yeah, I'm super cranky unless I can get back and do something. And is it just the meditative nature of the act or is it also that you skip the day so your super ego is a monkey on your back screaming in your ear? It's feeding the demon. It's yeah. it's it's keeping the super ego at bay and and then being able to sell myself the story that I did it. I did it. Yeah. Even I'd love to do more, but even if I don't, I did the minimum. I met the requirement of the day. So the super ego, you can just be quiet now and you can lie down and go to sleep. And for yeah. the most part, it works. Um, and thinking about yeah, my question a little bit from a different angle, I suppose it could be, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. It could be both at the same time. Yeah. Oh, and, and it's definitely therapeutic. Uh, it, there's nothing more exciting than when you hit on an idea or y- 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 yeah, there, there is something meditative about the process as well, but it's also when it's the thing that you do and that you care about and you invest yourself in um, it's this. Uh, so I've never done this. I'm, I'm not wired this way, but you know, those predominantly guys every weekend, they will wash their car. They will wax their car. They will polish their car. They will clean the inside and out. And they will do that every, it's not even dirty. And they will do it every weekend. It's this obsession thing because it's meditative and they care about it. And, and I think writing is a lot like that. I, 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 it's that thing that I need to repeatedly do to keep myself sane and on the level. And then if work gets out of control and it's super busy and I'm not enjoying any of that sort of stuff, I can say to myself, you know what though, at least I did this thing that I love and I got a little bit closer to where I want to get. So I can put up with all this other nonsense that I really don't care about, but you know, I have to do to pay the bills. It's that kind of thing as well. It's, it's a it yeah, it, it's, I mean, it's kind of like eating. It's, you know, it's like, it's nourishing. You, if you get that, you fine. If you miss it, you're hangry for the whole day until you get to eat again. And then, you know, go from there. Yeah. Yeah. Creativity is nourishment. I like it. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Well, this conversation itself is also extremely nourishing. Um, I would like to continue on if you will join me to five quick questions, which is like a a ending segment um, that I, haven't published all of them yet from the past five episodes or so, but um, are spun off as a, as a short episode segment, a mini episode from our uh, two hour episode here. If you have the cool. time for it, let's do it. And I'll before go short, we do it, is it answers. yeah. Is there anything else that you want to say and or speak about or put out into the 
ether um, before we jump into these questions? Anything that I didn't hit on that you wanted to? Just, I mean, most of the people that are going to watch this are like this anyway, because of the, the sort of people, but just let's be kind to one another. You know, there's, there's too much aggression. There's too much political back and forward. And let's just, let's be a little bit forgiving of each other. Nothing to do with my stuff, but, but also be forgiving of me as well. That'd be great. But you know what I mean? I think that's, that's what we need is a little bit more willingness to just let things slide and, you know, be a bit forgiving and caring and all that sort of stuff. That's it. Sorry. That was a bit, a bit mushy. No, I I love the mush. I think, (laughs) I think you're well on your way back to romance novels. (laughs) (laughs) Could be, could be. Um, I'm going to look over here because this is where somewhere on my wall of crazy is uh, my five quick questions. And the first one is, do you have a personal mantra? I do. My personal mantra is brick by brick. Uh, so as long as I get something done each day toward the creative enterprise that I'm, I'm wanting to achieve, then that's enough then that's fine. It doesn't have to be everything. It doesn't have to be massive, just something brick by brick. You build an empire brick by brick, not house at a time. So that's my mantra. And anyone listening to just this five quick question, short segment, we went into a whole lot uh, of depth into the brick by brick um, mantra during the full episode. But to keep this short and sweet, let's move on to number two, which is, is there an indispensable tool or what is an indispensable tool in your creator's toolbox? I would have to say uh, a diary and uh, a pen, uh, outline pen and a diary because I need to visualize what I'm doing and write notes and that's where it all, all starts. That and obviously a computer because without that, I'm not typing these things out on a typewriter. That would be horrific. But yeah, I'd say definitely pen, a, a little journal and a, and a nice pen, nice black pen. Yeah, I need them. And do you, do you journal to make this short question a little bit longer? Do you journal at all just as a practice of meditation or are you speaking specifically uh, about this tool in terms of capturing creative ideas and organizing your creative self? Specifically the creative side. Uh, when I have tried to write a journal, they end up becoming short stories or novels very quickly. So um, <laughs> just if that's going to happen anyway, I, uh, yeah, I use it more for that, but I do it fairly, fairly regularly. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Uh, number three is eyes on the prize. What is the prize for you, Morgan? Oh, this is an interesting one. So I don't have a specific goal. And even recently, I've been umming and ahhing about whether writing full time is the goal, because that's always been the, what I've been heading for. But even recently, I've been thinking, is, is that what I need? Is that the thing that is driving all this? Or is it more important that I have a body of work that is read and loved by um, I'll pick a number, let's say a thousand people that love my stuff and love the world and the characters that are created and all that sort of stuff. I think that would be uh, amazing. And that would make me feel very, very happy to, to achieve. Yeah. And as he says it, he smirks and smiles uh, in a I, very genuine I'm, fashion. So I think you might have something also, there for yourself. I'm also thinking this one comes up a lot and it's been coming up a lot lately and it's still evolving. I'm still thinking, what's the, what's the, where am I heading? But I think that that's the, that's the nice goal that I think I'd be heading for. Yeah. Yeah. And that is uh, sustainable and there's, I I don't remember where it comes from exactly, but um, basically finding your key audience that can sustain you financially Mm. and you could sustain them uh, because they are so interested in what you're putting out into the world. So there is that sweet yeah. spot for creators as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, great definitely. 
Uh, so four and five, this is where we put on our time travel hats or jump into a time <laughs> machine. What do you say? What's your method of time travel? It would be shorts of some kind. Yeah, shorts. definitely shorts. Time travel shorts. Not long yeah. pants. They won't make the trip. No, no. They, they always get ripped by something, you know, dinosaurs or whatever. So shorts, you're already prepared. And shorts that I guess, I mean, if you're worried about them getting snagged on anything, they have to be like Speedo or spandex. Exactly. Okay. And then it's just your naked flesh that's getting ripped by thorns, <laughs> not not pants. <laughs> so you might as well be naked. <laughs> Shorts are a silly idea, come to think of it. That's a, yeah, I, I didn't think this through at all. You've you've committed to it, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> uh, listeners of What's Your Random Podcast. Put on your short spe- Speedo spandex Speedo. and get ready because that is your time travel device. And question four is advice that you would give to a past self. Oh, there's two pieces of advice. One of them I would immediately tell him to ignore. So one of them is from the superego and that would be get started now, get started early, do more earlier. And then I would say, ignore that. You need to go through life and do the things you're doing to get to the point where you are. There's plenty of time. Take your time, enjoy life, enjoy the journey and think carefully about where you want to head and what it means to be a writer, both the positive and the negative of that. And then the other thing would probably be, there's not just one way to do this thing. It's not just full-time with a big publisher going through Netflix, going through whoever. There are many different ways of doing this and feeling fulfilled. So don't limit yourself to that one, one idea. And also the final piece of advice would be, you're going to have to shave that hair off, you know, fairly soon in your late twenties. So just get, get, get to it now, beat, beat reality to the punch. And just, you've got a fairly okay looking head. So you'll be fine, bald. Don't worry about it. And that would be it. And uh, for <laughs> listeners, Morgan wasn't reading that sound. Oh, there you go. That is a beautiful head. <laughs> Let me Thank give you. advice to your young self. Yeah, don't be ashamed of that beauty. <laughs> there's, a, there's a reason I have a flat cap though, because of the, the shine and the uh, just blend into everything. So at least this differentiates it a bit. <laughs> it's a good it's a good look. I like those hats. Um, yeah, I was going to say you didn't, I mean, that sounded almost, um, that sounded like a professional statement. Uh, I, I'm not used to these questions being answered. So uh succinctly and on the spot so well done that was not red ladies and gentlemen <laughs> um, so the next question we're time traveling in a different direction and uh, a question that you would have now for a future you oh does it ever grow back um no see the thing <laughs> the 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 yeah, it's really hard because the things I'm interested in are what 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 happens to us? What what what's the next ridiculous thing that we as a species invent? And what's what happens with the planet and space exploration and you know all of that sort of weird stuff that's going on? It's funny that I'm more interested in that than what what I am my own uh, sort of sort of stuff. Maybe that's because there's a a fear of the shadowy unknown of the future. Um, so maybe I'll do the arrogant kind of uh, self-promotion thing and just say, how good is it being at the top, bro? How good is it? <laughs> is it good now that you've made it? it sounds, like I'm, <laughs> sounds like I'm being sarcastic to myself. Maybe that's the way to do it. Was it worth it, bro? Was it worth it? I have no idea. Yeah, I really, you've stumped me with that one. How, how about if you look externally and, and want to ask some specific question about the nature of technology and the world and let your, your sci-fi creative side uh, ask the question, what would the question be? That would be, in terms of technology, how much of what is outside is now inside? How much has humanity built into itself? Um, 
And have we finally got to the point where we could conceive of a, a robotic or an automated uh, entity, self-aware entity that doesn't want to kill us? <laughs> because that's the only thing we can imagine is that robots that want to do us harm yeah. because that's what humans are like. But is it possible that a self-replicating AI could actually be benevolent and be better for us than what we are for ourselves? Who knows? Man, that's probably going to be a long way into the future. Well, maybe yeah. your future self is bionic and like living 500 years. So we, we didn't, we never stipulated how far in the future. Let that's your... what I'm thinking. I'm thinking head on a <laughs> stick, but with wires and stuff. Absolutely. And somehow hair that's grown back. That, that would be... <laughs> and a mane. Yeah, just massive, like too much a mane hair. That's Way braided too much hair. into your beard. Yeah. <laughs> because that's what be people fantastic. do in the future that's what it 500 years that's what it is braids are back people braids yeah uh, well we i never took the question that direction but i'm very glad that i did i'm very glad that you joined me today and uh i'm hoping that next time maybe i could get you to play the banjo for me because i see one hanging there behind you it's a deal it's a deal next yeah? time okay. we'll, we'll introduce with the banjo for sure awesome awesome any parting words for guests and i mean i'll close my spiel by saying thank you again for joining me and excited to see all of your many many worlds come to fruition in various media over the course of the future until you are a bionic man with a <laughs> mane of hair braided into his beard yes um <laughs> Well, the only thing I would say is that the beauty of being an indie author is that I love getting in touch with people, other authors, other creatives, artists, whatever. So by all means, reach out, find me on social media, uh, go to morganquaid.com, find me that way and talk, connect, you know? Um, yeah, it's hugely gratifying to talk to people that are of a similar mind and creative and all that sort of stuff. And this can be isolating. So um, please get in touch. I'd love to chat. And, um, and I want to thank you, Kev, for this. It's a great podcast and I, uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. This has been very cathartic for me too. Uh, and it's really nice to meet a, um, a fellow traveler in the, in the creative enterprise. So thank you very much. It's my pleasure. And uh, yeah, looking for things forward to things, to all the things to come. And until next time, enjoy the rain. <laughs>